After the release of Nashville Skyline, Dylan took the first steps towards resuming live performance, and it was the band to whom he once again turned. Though they'd briefly appeared on stage together at a Woody Guthrie tribute concert in January 68, a booking to play the Isle of Wight Festival in August 1969 would be the first time that Dylan and the band had played a full set in over three years. The festival and the reappearance of Bob Dylan was a hugely anticipated event. The Dylan that showed up at the Isle of Wight, he was straight off the cover of Nashville Skyline. You know, it was the country Dylan, um, both from the country music side and from the fact he'd, he'd come from the, the Woodstock country. He wasn't happy, I don't think, with the performance after the event, and it was a mixed performance. He had been in Britain for, for three years, and it was like the second coming of Dylan. This had been so eagerly awaited, and, and indeed, you know, it was so disappointing. He played for a little over an hour, seemed kind of detached and somewhat indifferent to the crowd. Well, it was like a two it was a sound problem before he went on and unfortunately as it was his first uh, besides the Woody Guthrie um, event as it was his first proper concert back I think he was very disappointed with the um, the end results following the Isle of Wight performance any residual perception that the band were principally Dylan's backing group was about to change forever in the months preceding the festival, the band had been recording their eponymous second album, and with Robertson stepping forward as chief songwriter, they had abandoned the Dylan covers and basement material of Big Pink in the search for a coherent identity of their own. Well, the difference between the Big Pink album and the band's second album was that in the second album there was a sort of a concept having to do with the Civil War and the working man and this kind of thing. The first album was just a collection of songs. That's all it was. After all, they had a few Dylan songs, and they were pulling very much on their old influences. Though those, those old influences were in play in the second album, Dylan's songs were not there. It had to be much more of a band alone album. So you can say that. Even in the, the graphics in the back of the album, it says, uh, well, you're there when the band starts playing, you know, that quote from uh, that old... Uh, Dixieland song. So there was a real sense of, of it being them. And the album was called The Band, you know. It was not called Music from Big Pink. This is it. This is who we are. You know, Robbie has stepped forward by now, certainly, and taken the mantle, taken the reins as the leader, the most together member of the band, and the guy who, who really does bother to get up in the morning and do some work and write some songs and put these songs together, write lyrics. We rented a house, so it was very much like the Big Pink experience. We were all in a house together that had a recording studio in it. Robbie was writing the songs as we went. And as he would write a song, uh, he would pretty much cast it as to who would be the singer of it, and then we would work on it and go and rehearse it and rehearse it for a couple of days and then record it and rehearse it for a couple of days and record it. It is one of the little landmarks in sort of proto-Americana is the second album. It's a kind of novel in song form. It's it's a scrapbook based on Robbie's infatuation with the American South as channeled through primarily Leave On Hell. It's through Leave On that Robbie discovers the South, you know, way before this, first visits down to the South as one of the Hawks, Leave On shows him around Arkansas. So Robbie really gets his face up close to the window of what it must be like to be a, a southerner. The second album is Robbie's fantasy. It's a it's a Yankees, a Canadians 
fantasy of what the South, the Deep South, really means, the history, the romanticism of life during, since the Civil War. And he's kind of using Levon's voice in particular as the manifestation of that Southern flavor, that Southern character. It also introduced tensions into a group that had existed for years in easy fraternity. Given the album's themes in context of Lee von Helm's personal experience, Robertson's monopoly of the songwriting credits did permanent damage to relationships within the band. You see, writing the song is just part of it. And this speaks to the big dispute between Robbie and Lee von. The old school in songwriting is that the composer and the lyricist share the credit for the song. End of story. The new model that happened in a lot of rock and roll bands was that one of the members of the band shows up with a germ of an idea, kicks it around, somebody else says, oh, I got a guitar part for it, I have a drum part for it, I have a bass part for it, I have a keyboard part for it, they change it around, I, I want to change the melody this way because it fits my voice better. And in the end, they've got a more collaborative piece, and so they all slap their names on the song. Robbie was adhering to the old model. Levon wanted to adhere to the new model. Levon felt that a lot of the inspiration for these songs, particularly the ones that had to do with the South, came from his personal experience and things that he'd shared with Robbie. And that a lot of the, what made the song come to life were contributions of his as well as contributions, contributions from the other guys in the band. Band member differences notwithstanding, the album was an enormous success. Released on the 22nd of September 1969, it quickly broke the Billboard chart top 10 and proved hugely influential in rehabilitating the sound of the rural South into contemporary American music. The band's second album is a peak for anybody. When you talk about Pet Sounds and Sgt. Pepper and whatever you want to talk about, you've got to throw in the band's second album. There's hardly a naff note on it. It still has, there, I feel there's still the retro rockets firing from their close association with Bob Dylan. It is a key inspiration and link for the alt country and Americana scenes today. You cannot scratch a Jayhawks or a Wilco or a Lucinda Williams or a Fleet Foxes and not find somebody that's heard the band's second album over and over and over again. It changed the way that long-haired people looked at the South. That a band who'd played behind Dylan, who you know, had been at the sort of forefront of the civil rights, music, that this group could write a song and release a song called The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down, an elegy, a lament for the South as it, as it goes down in the Civil War. I mean, this was, this was profoundly radical or sort of in, in a kind of inverted way. And I think it, it changed the way a lot of people thought about the South. Suddenly the South started to become kind of hip again. See the man with the stage frame. The band's early success and creative energy proved ultimately to be unsustainable and over the course of the early 70s, their star began to wane. By 1973, the group were in bad shape. In a move that suggested some nostalgia for their Hawks days, they released an album of classic R&B covers entitled Moondog Matinee. Reviews were tepid. You can see, to a certain extent, while there's wonderful songs on every record the band ever did, you can see and hear that the air's seeping out of their particular balloon a little bit. They partied too hard, uh, they didn't work hard enough. By the time Dylan asked them to you know, saddle up and go on the road with him again, and he did record an album with him again, I think it was probably, it came as some, you know, as a, something of a lifesaver. And the reunion came at a time when Dylan's own career was threatening to drift. Recent LPs had met with mixed reviews, none of which were overly enthusiastic, and the lack of touring had toned down his profile. 
Having left Columbia and signed for David Geffen's Asylum Records, Dylan elected to preface his return to touring with a new album and asked the band to join him in the studio to record Planet Waves. You know, it had been low key for two or three years. And I mean, you know, a huge amount going on. He put out baffling records and some pretty poor records that, that just uh, had everybody scratching their heads. Uh, lots of sort of, you know, cover songs that no one would have imagined him doing on things like Self Portrait and the, the Dylan album and, you know, odd good things scattered amongst all of this. But, you know, what on earth was Dylan doing? You know, what, 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 where is he going? You know, is, is, are, we, are we ever going to hear important, meaningful music from this guy again? He would stagnate if he stood still. But I think his problem was that he didn't know where to go at that time. I think there was still even people looking at what had happened in the basement tapes. There was still a, a whole mystery behind that missing period. And of course, from uh, 1969 onwards, um, there had been a flood of Dylan bootlegs. I mean, obviously, the Great White Wonder, which in part used demos from, uh, from the big pink basement sessions, uh, was of course the first ever rock bootleg. People still wanted to know who Bob Dylan was and what his next move was going to be. He was still very high profile. 